On this episode, we're gonna be giving remote collar advice, the best way to keep your puppy from going in the house where it's not supposed to be, uh, how to get your dog to stop barking when it hears neighbors or people that come to the door. We're also gonna be giving advice for a owner that has a three-legged dog in a way where you can still give discipline, rules, and structure while also considering their handicap. We're also going to be answering Tim Ferriss's question and a little bit more. Okay, so the first question is from La Doggy Cafe. Hi Blake, as you now know, we just rescued a pit with a missing front leg. Our challenge is to create and maintain a good rhythm with her on walk and communicate effectively with leash pressure. To get going, she needs to give herself a push and gain a certain speed, otherwise it's heavy on her back and she turns into this big heavy blob. Once she's going, it's a hopping on three legs motion, which has its challenges considering she's up, down, up, down. I don't mean to apply pressure, but it's confusing to follow. What's your advice? Um, this is a little bit of a challenge. The first thing I'm gonna go ahead and say is when I'm working with most dogs, most dogs are, are just flat out um, used to not listening. Uh, in your situation, you obviously have to take some things into consideration, right? You have a dog that is a little bit handicapped that has a little bit of a different type of wobble on the walk. So you obviously can't correct or be upset for that. but. When you have that walk and you have that speed limit, which is kind of up and down, you have to be mindful of not applying leash pressure when you don't want to stop a dog or applying leash pressure that might come too harshly if the dog is kind of doing that. So the one thing I'm gonna go ahead and say is that usually when you're applying leash pressure, you're trying to get your dog to either stop or turn. What I'm gonna go ahead and say is that you want to start practicing giving the dog the understanding of leash pressure by doing large uh, U-turns, right? Because your dog is likely going to struggle to feel pressure going back. And this is the same advice I give in general, but your dog is gonna struggle to feel pressure going back and kind of go against it. You wanna make sure that your leash pressure is almost always ahead of the dog and guiding them into a wider turn to help the dog to easily kind of go where it is that you want and then maybe softly leash pressure into a sit. I'm, I'm not sure which leg is missing, but um, obviously we have to take that in consideration. Still have to give the dog rules, but make sure we can accommodate them um, where we're not asking for too much while also not letting them get away with murder as a result of the three leg. They're still a dog. We should still treat them. Everything should still be an equal, right? Um, hopefully that helps. You guys are doing great things over there in, uh, in Canada. And thank you so much for the question. How do you get your dog to stop barking when he hears your neighbors or when someone comes to the door? Next question is from Kimberly. Went to college with you. Congrats on your marriage. It's the second episode that we congrats. Everybody's getting married these days. Um, how do you get your dog to stop barking when he hears neighbors or when someone comes to the door? All right, first thing I'm gonna say, Kim, um, you have to stop giving your dog so much freedom to run around the house and do as he or she pleases. Um, it's really, really hard to work on impulse control and, and preventing a dog from being concerned when they're allowed to do all the everyday, like everyday things that they're concerned with, every, every impulse that they have, right? Um, and I, I've spoken about this in, in other episodes in the past. Um, if the dog is kind of hanging out and is just laying down at your feet and you're watching something on Netflix, you decide to kind of get up and go to the bathroom, your dog needs to follow you there or your need, dog needs to follow you into the kitchen when you pour yourself something to drink. Those are all opportunities to work on an impulse control outside of your problem. So your problem is more like the test. Um, the issue that you're having is you're trying to tackle the test head on without studying, right? And we've all done it in college, try to go into a test without studying. Unless we're cheating, it doesn't really work so good and it's really difficult to cheat when it comes to uh, teaching your dog these things. So you have to get them to study. One of the easiest ways to get them to study is have them practice holding duration places, duration exercises, when they're holding it down, they're holding these things away from you around challenges, little by little you increase those challenges. Your, your biggest issue is that when someone comes to the door, when they hear something, they're allowed to do this. So they're allowed to squirrel, essentially, right? And what happens with that is, it's already doing this and then there's a charge. If you're working on a dog holding place and you're, you're stopping their physical urge to when they feel like getting up, just going to charge for something or getting up and doing this, and this is outside of just 
when someone comes to the door, just in regular situations, you put food on the ground or food, your own food falls on the ground and your dog just gets up and goes after it. Little things like that. And, and I mean, that may or may uh, be your dog exactly. Or you might say, oh, my dog doesn't do those things. If your dog doesn't do that specifically, find what does challenge your dog and get them to hold a position regardless or despite what that distraction is, right? That's what you have to start challenging. So that way they get used to having an impulse and having an urge and not acting on it, right? Your dog right now has the impulse and the urge when it hears something and they just do it. If you work on the impulse control stuff, what's gonna end up happening is you're gonna have a dog that's trained to, instead of just react, they might do this and then you're gonna be able to start interrupting that. So it's almost like grandma interrupt me before I even reach to go for the cookies. You have, you have, um, me thinking about going for the cookie jar and grandma goes, don't even think about it. And it's like, damn, how does she know? You want to interrupt the thought process of what the dog is about to do, not um, the actual act, right? So what we have to do is set ourselves up for success. If your leash pressure is good, if you pair that with vocal commands, with vocal touch, all that stuff um, serves as, as an opportunity to practice, right? If you order takeout, set your dog up on a leash. Make sure your leash pressure is solid, right? Make sure that every time you use the leash and you correct and you interrupt, if the dog is over here and you create this, you startle the dog and interrupt the process of right? And if you're working on impulse control and place and all those things prior, it's gonna be, it's gonna be pretty easy to do, right? Um, we can get into more detail with this, but there is a lot of beginner foundation stuff that you wanna work on to make yourself surely successful. We can jump right into the problem um, and, and tackle it and, and probably have success, but in order for it to be really, really smooth, you want that language um, and that foundation down prior so that you can take that and bring it to the problem and say, hey, you've been studying this. So when I start to use this, when I start to use the leash, when I start to use pairing my voice with the leash, which is more meaningful, um, all of these things uh, actually uh, result in the dog paying attention to what it is that you're saying rather than ignoring it because it doesn't mean anything, right? Um, What's the best way to keep a puppy from going to the bathroom in the house? He knows to hold it until he's outside, but it still happens often. We're gonna go into uh, Gianno, Missouri. Um, one of my buddies from school as well. You guys just got a puppy, awesome. You wanna know the best way from having the dog go to the bathroom in the house. Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna say, if, if your dog knows how to hold it till he's outside, you're already one step ahead of the game. What you need to start doing is you have to start crate training your dog, right? You, right now, your dog has too many um, too many options, right? So if you're looking at multiple choice questions A through Z, you're giving your dog potential answers A through Z when you're, you're trying to make it very, very, you should be making it very simple. It should be right and wrong, right? But now you're saying, hey, when you feel that urge to go, you can go here, let's, I, I don't know if you're doing this, you can go on the wee wee pad, or you can go over there by the sofa, or you can go over there, or you can go over here when you lay down, you can choose, and if you happen to go over there, you can hang out over here. Your dog is too young and not responsible enough just yet to make those decisions, so you wanna limit that. So basically what we do when we're housebreaking a dog and getting it really solid, you already have a dog that's going outside, awesome, you're ahead of the game. Now what you need to start doing is set your dog up where if they go outside, then you give them a little bit of free time in the house, right? But you have to be really good time managers and know, okay, the dog tends to make the mistake about a half hour in, about 45 minutes, an hour in, whatever it is, this is the time where I'm gonna take the dog out. If the dog doesn't go out, the dog goes right back in the crate. Now, if your dog is going out and marking and then coming in and marking, you have a marking issue. So what you have to do is you have to catch the dog in the act and correct that and, and, and know that when your dog is kind of smelling around, you want to interrupt that thought process where they're like, oh, I guess I can go, this smells good because you know your dog is going to go over there and just mark, start interrupting that. If your dog is not marking and is just relieving themselves like a puppy by mistake, then you need to be more of a better time manager and confine them to where they actually hang out and spend more time in, right? So your dog should be crate trained so that they're actually, and this is gonna kill you and your, and your girl, you shouldn't, be, um, you shouldn't be having the dog sleeping in your bed. Because what's happening is the dog isn't spending time in the crate. If the dog spends time in the crate and they drink their water there, they hang out there, they're there a lot, they don't wanna relieve themselves where they spend time. That's why you'll notice they tend to kind of go in areas, even if it's on your bed, they'll pee in one corner and they'll hang out over here. If a dog knows that they spend time in that crate, which isn't a huge playpen, but it's enough for them to lay down, turn around, drink their water, 
They might make a mistake a couple of times, but eventually what happens is you have a dog that knows, man, I'm, I'm in here and I know they always take me out. If you're consistent with your timing and you always get your dog out, even if that means you're getting them out more often than possible, what's gonna happen is you're gonna have a dog that goes, I have a reason to hold it because I know he's gonna get me out. Right? So when he goes out, good job, give him a little bit of freedom because you know he's not gonna end up peeing and then you're gonna go into that. You can pet this guy right here, go for it. <laughs> what are you guys playing, Tag? Manhunt. Manhunt? Have fun. I remember that game. Later, man. Um, let's see what else we're looking at. Yeah, so hopefully that helps, man. You got to be a better time manager, overcompensate for getting your dog out, confine your dog more so it's basically wrong and right. It's the crate and out. You don't give your dog the opportunity or their liberty to make the mistakes inside. We got some action going on here, right? Did they, what, did they find a body or something? A guy od Pant, pant to that real quick. I can't get a good shot with the thing right now. It's not matter, show it real quick. That's crazy. That's unfortunate. It's New York City, but we're still here for you, right? Um, okay, let's see what else we got. Okay, Josh. Just got my mini educator 302 in today, looking for advice on how to fit it properly on my King Corso. I've only spent a small amount of time working with it, but I'm running into this issue. If I place the contact points on, on the underside of his neck, there's a lot of loose skin and I don't seem to get good contact. But on the top back of his neck, he is much less sensitive and it seems I need to use a much higher number to get him to notice. Any advice? This is a little bit of, of a, a more advanced cause, question because you're using, you're using a 302. So if you're using a 302, you have two dogs, right? Um, one dog I assume is fine. And the second dog is um, is your cane corso that has some loose skin. What, one thing I'm going to say is you definitely don't want it too loose, obviously, but you don't want it too tight. I'm not a huge fan of putting it up top. Um, you can do that. The levels might be a little bit higher. Um, it really depends on the dog and how you're, um, how you're using it. It's kind of funny the way people act around dogs, right? Um, but um, where was I going with this? I'm going to go ahead and say that not putting it in the center and offsetting here and finding that area where it's just sitting should be fine. Now, if you know that it's sitting in a point where if the dog turns, it's gonna end up hanging, your main concern is just making sure that it's touching. If you have loose skin and a lot of skin, it actually shouldn't be that difficult for you to know that, that it is kind of touching there. We see that a lot with bulldogs. So sometimes what we'll do is it'll be more beneficial to keep it either higher on the neck or more beneficial to keep it lower if you have a collar that's above that. Right, um, it really kind of depends on the circumstance, but um, I mean, we have we have a couple bulldogs in for our board and train program right now, and um, and uh, we keep the prong collar up top, and then we have the remote collar low. We just cock it to the side, and what I do is I don't feel for the straps up top. I actually take my two fingers and I feel if those contact points are touching. Another thing you can do is you can look into um, a comfort pad. So a comfort pad is basically. Um, you may or may not be familiar with this, but um, instead of the, the stock contact points that, that come with the um, remote collar, a comfort bag will have multiple. Um, if, if it's a 302, it's gonna have four. So it's a little more comfortable and you have more contact points that are touching. So because you have more contact points that are touching, you have a better, um, a better shot at those being on the dog's neck. All right. Um, let's see, so that answers all of this here. We're gonna get into Tim Ferriss' question. He's been asking up some questions. Looks like he just got a dog. Any dog trainers out there? I'm all for positive reinforcement dog training, but most experts seem to dodge a major question. What can you do when pups do something bad? Example, chewing, furniture, jumping up on chairs, etc. besides ignoring it. Redirecting is one way to get them to temporarily stop, but it wouldn't seem to teach them that something isn't allowed. Anyone with experience out there? Thanks. Any dog trainers out there, he's all for positive reinforcement. But experts seem to be dodging a major question. And trust me, I, this is, I've, I've spent a lot of time studying as much and as many different methods as, as possible. And uh, this is something that I was running into as well, which was causing a problem because it wasn't realistic to me in real world situations, right? So like I was able to redirect the dog and that was no issue. I was able to redirect a dog and that wasn't an issue, Damn. but um, 
<laughs> but um, when we were going to redirect, I wasn't teaching the dog um, not to do it. So I was simply pulling them down or I was simply stopping them, but it wasn't making it clear, like, don't do that again. So one of the examples that I, I typically use, Andrew, paying attention here? All right. One of the examples that I typically use is, um, is uh, if you and I had a kid together, hey, and his name was uh, Jimmy. And we always told Jimmy every single time, it's a lot of, hey, pan and show all this stuff that's going on right now so people can see like what's happening with them. Like we're talking real world stuff, right? So to answer your question here, Tim, um, when we're talking about real world behavior, Andrew, don't go too far though, buddy. Uh, yeah, I just want to show all of this, right? So when, when we're talking real world behavior, you look at the three dogs that are sitting next to me, um, this, there's a lot of distractions. There's people on the pong table, across. there's all this stuff that's happening. Um, if you want your dogs to behave in real world situations, they have to know good, bad, yes, no, hot, and cold. The problem with and I'm a huge, I'm all for positive reinforcement. I'm a huge fan of positive reinforcement. But positive reinforcement by itself is very limiting, right? So let's go back to this story. You and I have a kid together. His name is Jimmy. We always tell Jimmy, hey, buddy, whenever you want to go get ice cream, when the ice cream truck pulls up in front, you don't have to ask for permission. You can just go ahead and you can get ice cream, right? So every day when the ice cream truck pulled up in front of the house, Jimmy would just go run and get ice cream. One day, the ice cream truck pulls up across the street and to make it more dramatic across the street means across houston street in new york city that's a very very busy intersection right so innocently jimmy never thank you man appreciate it <laughs> innocently it's new york city for you <laughs> innocently um um where am i going with this i'm sorry man i'm getting distracted myself jimmy runs across the street almost gets hit by three cars as, as parents, are we honestly expected to follow the positive reinforcement only mantra of reward the good, ignore the bad? I'm pretty sure, I don't know about you, but my answer, I know for a fact that if my kid is making a mistake, I'm going to let him know that he made a mistake and say, hey, depending on his age, if, if Jimmy's young, you almost got hurt, Jimmy, you can't do that again. Next time that happens, ask for permission. When it's here, you can do, I'm gonna make it clear for him. I'm, essentially, I'm gonna give him more information to let him know um, in this circumstance, you have to do this, but in this circumstance, it's okay to do this, right? Making the information clear by giving more information is gonna set him up to be successful, right? Now, for me, I would never, if he almost gets hit by three cars, gets the ice cream, and I go, ooh, he made a bad choice, let's ignore that, wait till he makes the right choice again, and let him know he did a good job for the right choice. It doesn't make any sense, right? Then you have to take other things into consideration, right? Sometimes certain behaviors are fun for dogs, right? Um, New York City, there's squirrels everywhere. Chasing squirrels can be fantastic. I can get the dog to make a right choice for a juicy piece of steak, and the dog can, even in some situations, prefer to make the right choice. It doesn't teach them that that is the wrong choice. And what happens when you run into that is that a dog can do that and that can be a life or death situation, right? So we wanna make that very clear that there's some things that are no for right now. There's some things that are no, don't ever do that again because that can be a dangerous situation. So that's why we're for, we're for using all four quadrants of operating conditioning, right? Correcting your dog, letting your dog uh, understand that um, this is no, that's very, very important, right? Now, how to do it is based on the circumstance and the situation, right? Does your dog know the word nope? For us, nope is an actual choice. Saying, um, saying nope is basically stop doing what you're about to do and go back to doing what you were going to do, right? And we teach that. We teach that through using um, negative punishment, positive punishment, negative reinforcement, and positive reinforcement. We use all of those quadrants. It's really, really important. Um, depending on how we use that is based on the tools, based on the markers, everything that we're using. But a dog must know no. They must understand that some things are off limits just like I did. The only reason I knew that when I was in a playground and I was yelling and screaming and playing tag and I was able to have a blast with my best friend is because my parents said it was allowed. 
When I was with my best friend in school, when a teacher was trying to teach, I knew that while we were in the classroom, I wasn't allowed to play tag because they told me the rules. They told me, no, you can't do that when I tried. When I did try, they didn't ignore it and say, let him do it. We'll let him know when he makes the right choice and then we're gonna give him a sharpened pencil or then we're, we're, we're gonna give him a sticker and let him know that's the right choice, don't do that again. It doesn't make sense. From a common sense point of view, doesn't make sense, right? So uh, that's my answer to you, man. Uh, the last question that we have here, Blake, my dear friend and mentor, Miles from Calm Leash Canine here. I fit a little roadblock with a client of mine. I have a dog here for a two week board and train that actually needs to stay an additional week due to anxiety issues. I recently just figured out that a tool I'm using, the e-collar, is causing the stress, but this is a problem because the tool must be used. Please know I introduced the dog to the collar the way I do all dogs that come for training, in low distraction and on leash using treats. But when I go to put it on, I notice he starts to tremble a bit. I just need some help on how to reevaluate how to use it for him so as to have this be an effective tool. Thanks for all the help. Keep up the outstanding work. Oh, and also, the dog is on very low levels on the e-collar. I am only working him on level four. I plan on increasing his exercise doing intro treadmill work as well. But is there anything else I need to add or take away to have this dog be conditioned to the e-collar? Okay, from Miles, from Calm Leash Canine. You hit a little roadblock. Okay, now the first thing I'm gonna go ahead and say is I'm not even gonna ask why you need it, um, the remote collar, because it's a great tool. I'm gonna go ahead and say that even if a dog is fearful and anxious prior to or during a remote collar because of, of past experience or not, um, it's still a great tool to use and it's actually one of our go-to tools for anxiety, for fearful dogs, for confidence building. And I know that's something that people say can't be done. They don't know what they're talking about, right? Um, it's all in how you use the tool. So it is one of my go-to tools. The first thing I'm gonna say is that if the presence of the tool is what's getting the dog to tremble when it's gonna go on, um, we need to stop taking training time as, okay, now it's time to train, now this tool goes on, and that tool needs to be on more often throughout everyday regular life, right? So it should be feeding time, it should be fun time, it should be whether you're using the remote, whether you're not using the remote. That way we can get out of the dog's brain of, oh, when this goes on, oh my gosh. So let it go on, let them, oh my gosh, and then let them live their life when nothing bad happens and they get over that fact, right? That's something that really needs to be done. Feeding time, twice, maybe even three times a day when that's on, whether you're using it or not. And then when you go back to using it, make sure that leash pressure response is solid without the tool. We actually have a dog right now in our boarding train uh, facility, Atticus, if you guys are following him, who started freaking out when he felt the remote sensation and it wasn't because of anything, he just wasn't used to that sensation. So we spent more time teaching leash pressure. By the time that was good, we layered that over what he was already doing and what he already knew, right? So if your dog had a past experience, keep that on longer throughout regular everyday situations and then begin to use it when everything else is good and go to another tool to resort to so that you can take that tool that your dog is confident in or that exercise without the remote collar, it could still be on not using it, and begin to start to layer that over the tool that is stronger. In this case, leash pressure, whatever it might be, right? Um, the fact that the dog is anxious or nervous or, 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 or fearful of it, it's not the end of the world uh, because of the tool, right? That's like saying that because the dog that I rescued um, got abused and adopted with a broomstick, that means that when uh, I adopt him and he comes into my place, I can't sweep because I can't use a broom. For, some people might do that, they might live their life that way, or my dog is afraid of water, I can't drink water bottles around them. To me, that's ridiculous. So what I'm gonna go ahead and do is I'm gonna teach my dog, hey buddy, you might have gotten abused and beat with this broomstick, but here that doesn't happen, so check it out. This is how I use the broom. And my dog might be petrified of it if he had gotten abused in the past, but over time he's gonna realize, oh, that doesn't get used anymore. So you have to be able to challenge your dog in that way. Um, to touch the topic of last week's episode, when we were talking about Mr. Pink, uh, Miss, what was I, Mr. Brown, and then there was Mr. Blonde, and I said uh, it was a racist comment. We also brought Blackface Lola, who's doing her best uh, Robert Downey Jr. impersonation in, what was it, Tropic Thunder? and Tropic Thunder, right? So this is Blackface for you, Blackface Lola. Um, yeah, hopefully that answers your question, man. Uh, go to town with using other stuff, get that stronger. Keep that on more often. A lot of times when we get dogs that don't wanna listen when we put certain tools on and stuff, you start to realize it's you're only putting this tool on when it's time to train and do the exercise. Have those on regularly throughout their life and you should start to see that take time. Another thing that we're gonna say is that when you're working with those clients, 
um, it's not really on their time schedule or yours. Uh, when you're working with anxiety and you're working with fear, you really have to consider the dog and, and their time frame, and you can only do so much. You have to work on their level. So you have to be uh, honest with the, with the owners and say, this is where we are and this is what we're going to need, whether that means the dog is staying with you longer or that means they understand that you're getting a dog to a certain point, and then we have to continue that when it goes back with them uh, when you start working with them, okay? Because um, these things do take time. Fear, anxiety are actually um, on a longer time frame considering the dog than just flat out aggression. Even, even aggression where dogs have killed dogs or, or mauled humans, um, that's more of an easy fix than hardcore fear, hardcore anxiety, hardcore um, uh, stress and all that stuff. Not because it's not easy to do, it just takes more time. All right, man? Um, awesome episode, sorry for the chaos. I know there's a lot going on, but this is New York City. This is real deal, real world dog training. And uh, hopefully that helps. I'll see you guys next week for episode seven.